Hey Lord Island residents and friends of social media and music fans from around the world. Welcome to episode number three of the Lodi Show. And today's special guest is the first guitar player for the legendary punk rock group The Misfits, originally from Lodi, Frank Licata, aka Franche Coma. He's going to join us today and we're going to talk about The Misfits and the recording of the legendary album Static Age. So stay tuned, enjoy the show, and have a great day. Residents and friends of social media, Lieutenant Mobilio here from the Lodi Police Department, and welcome to the Lodi Show, episode number three. Today's special guest is Frank Licata, aka Franche Coma from The Misfits, the legendary punk rock group from Lodi, The Misfits. And we're here today to talk about the recording of Static Age. Welcome, Frank. How are you today? Good to see you, Dave. So, Frank, just before we get into the, the Misfits and the recording of Static Age, you were born and raised in Lodi, correct? Yes. And, and where did you, you grow up in town? Well, I was born, like I said, I was born on, on uh, I believe, on Home Place. Um, and later on, you know, we moved after my father passed. Well, when my father passed away, we had moved to Reese Park, and that's where I, where I was until I got married. And you still live in Lodi today? I still right? live in Lodi today. So what, what schools what schools did you go to? I went to Wilson School, Lodi High School, but I left Lodi High School, but, you know, came back, but, uh, yep. So you, you went to Wilson School? In Wilson Lodi, School, yes. All the way through, from kindergarten all the way through? From kindergarten to eighth grade. Did you go to, I was going to say, eighth grade there. So yes. you didn't go to the middle school? There was no middle school. No middle school. So you went all the way from yes. K through eight and then to the high school. Right. So let's start talking a little bit about the misfits and, um, how old were you when you started actually playing guitar? 16, 17. Like that. Really? Yeah, that? later on. Yeah. And so being 16, 17, who were some I, of I, let me, I started when I was 8, but I stopped. <laughs> okay. I stopped and then started again. And uh, who were some of your uh, musical influences growing up? Who, who influenced you in, into playing the guitar and getting into music? Uh, professionally? No, as, as a kid, as, as growing up, uh, just before you pick, you know, at 16, you pick up the guitar. Who were some of your? I like, like, I like Mick Ronson. I like Mick Rouse, both of those two guitar players. So those Mick Ronson players. being with Rod Stewart and Mick Rouse being with. Uh, Mick Ronson was with David Bowie. David Bowie, David, David Bowie, Bowie, and then uh, Mick Rouse was, was with uh, Bad Company, but Bad Company. I forgot who, who was with before. I don't know who he was. He wasn't with three, not three. No, no, I don't think so. But I, I really like Mick Ronson. Yeah. That was your favorite. Any anybody else? You know, the plays are good. I don't put anybody down. You always take a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Okay. So, getting to the mitzvahs, how did you wind up joining the band? And, and, and at that time, how old were you when you when you joined? Uh, I would have been, let's see, seven, 21. You were 21 years 20, old already by the time? Yeah. yeah. 2021. Do you remember what, about what year? Well, it would have been 77, so I would have to have been just actually 20, going on 21 the next year. And, and how did you wind up getting in into the band? Well, we used to hang around. I was friends with Jerry and some some of the other guys we hung around. We used to hang around down by Redstone Lane and stuff like that. Jerry being Jerry Owen. Jerry Owen, yes. <coughs> uh, Manny Martinez happened to live across the park. Right. And I don't know how. I can't remember how Jerry got hooked up with Manny and they were starting the band. And then after they were together for I don't know, let's say six months, give or take a few. And Jerry, you know, knew I was playing the guitar, and they were looking, you know, like one time the guitar player, and he wound up bringing me down into the band. So the three of them were already together. Yes. Was Jerry Olney, uh, Glenn Danzig, and Manny Martinez were already. Correct. Were they already called the Misfits? I yes. Guess? They were. Yes. So who actually came up with that name? Of, of oh, them? I would say Glenn. Glenn. And, and before you came into the band, they didn't have a guitar player, correct? No, correct. So. What did they do musically? Glenn was playing keyboards. An electric keyboard? Electric keyboard, bass, and drums. And that was it? That was it. And Glenn was singing at that time already? Yes, yes. And, and then you joined the Misfits, and at that time, did they have any of the songs that you wound up recording on, on Static Age? Yeah, what happened was the first time I played with them at this uh, place called Eddie's Lounge in Teaneck, 
they did a set, and then I came on like for the second set, I, about five or six songs. They introduced John. Yeah, yes, yeah. on guitar. And at that time, you were uh, the drummer for the band was Manny Martinez. Still Manny, yes. And then, but for the recording of this album, you guys changed drummers. Shortly thereafter, Manny left the band, and uh, Mr. Jim, Jim Catania, took yeah. over on drums. Another Lodi guy, correct? Another Lodi guy, right. Central F. So at that point in time, the Misfits were completely and totally all made up of, of Lodi residents. Correct. Okay. Any reason why Manny left? Do you, do you I don't remember, remember why. why I really don't remember why he left. I can tell you, there was a, <laughs> there was a fire at his house, and uh, we were used to rehearse at his house. Mm -hmm. One morning, Glenn and Jerry are knocking at my, actually, I think they were throwing a little pebbles at my window upstairs at 6 in the morning to come out. Manny's house burned down with all the equipment. So uh, it was like shortly thereafter, right, right around that time that he left the band. Yeah. Did, it, did the equipment get destroyed there at his? Yeah, everything, all the, the guitars weren't there, but he lost his drums. We lost our amplifiers that were there, yes. Now, just before we get into really talking about the recording of Static Game, when you came to, to join the band, were you already friends with? Did you were you friends with these guys? Did you go to Jerry. school with Jerry? Oh, you were Jerry. Jerry. Yeah, you because Jerry and I had like Jerry was friends with my friend Billy. Billy was friends with me. We all had we all hung around together. It was a bunch of us, you know. So we were all friends. And then you got introduced to Glenn, or did you already yeah, know I, Glenn? Yeah, I, I I only knew Glenn um, probably just from name, you know what I mean. But I didn't really know him. Right. So yes, to answer your question, yes. So you were really you were really Jerry's friend, and Jerry yes. brought you into the band, and that's how you guys started. And yes. So when you got into the band, and, and you guys were getting ready to record Static Age, I, I'm sure the main writer was 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 Glenn, correct? Glenn was the same as songwriter. Yes. Did Did you have input though on to the music that was was being made, and how you guys were putting the songs I together? I mean, the way he did it was he knew how it was going to be, but he might say, "Do something like this over there." Or, 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 Try something there, right. you know what I mean. But for the most part, he, you know, he wrote the songs. You know, he might say, Dude, I don't know, you know, try something a little bit different. So he kind of tell you how. It, yeah, he, the he sound you know, something he was... like, yeah, I'm, I'm hearing this, or try that. And he said, no, nah, no, nah, forget it. Oh yeah, that's good. You know what I mean? So before you, I, I guess it was before you even put out the the album, you could tell me one of your first performances. You're at one of the clubs and you put your guitar. On a stove? Uh, That's the same night at Eddie's Lounge, first time. And what, what happened? What happened was the, the dressing room in the back was like a kitchen. Hmm. Not a kitchen that they were using to cook it, you know what I mean? Yeah. For, for, the, for, the, for the, uh, the bar, if you will. I put it on the stove, just put the case up there with the guitar, and somebody must have leaned on the gas. And until the day I got rid of that guitar, which I never should have, they had the, the ring with, the, with, with all the vinyl burnt off. You can see the circle. On the guitar, on the guitar, on the case, on the case. Anything ever happened to the guitar? No, no, no. We caught it right away. Oh, okay. Somebody, somebody just leaned on the stove. I was foolish for putting it on the stove, and then somebody leaned on the stove. Now, That's funny, you know that. We're, we're, I'm <laughs> going to talk a little. I'm going to talk a little bit about <clears throat> the equipment that you used to record this the album. But was that the same guitar that you used? Yes. And what kind of guitar was it? That was a '76 Gibson Reissue Explorer. And, and your amplification that you used. To record the album? Yeah. Well, the amplification we used to play live was the stuff that burnt at Manny's, which was an Ampeg V4 and V2. Mm -hmm. But that eventually got, that had to get replaced. Um, but to record, <coughs> I'm pretty sure, outside of my the fuzz box and stuff that I was using, the amplifier in the studio, is, I believe, is what I used, which I believe was a Fender Twin Reaper. Yeah. If I'm not at, at the studio. studio at CI Recordings, I didn't bring an amp. Any pedals? Did you have any? Pedals? I had my own. I had my own fuzz pedal. Yeah. That was all you used. Was the, yeah. I was used the the pedal. Big, I you? used a Big Muff Pot. You should have told me I would have brought it. I still have the same. I still have the same pedal. And it still works. Great. I just had. I had. I had an electro harmony exchange. Uh, uh, one little part on something was wrong with it. Right. But I still have that pedal. I want to talk a little bit about the imagery. Now, for most of of you out there who don't know the Misfits or never heard the Misfits, I'm sure that if you look right here and you see this skull, you've seen that skull a million times. It's it's famous worldwide, and and that's their their one of their mascots called the, the Crimson Ghost. Am I correct on correct. that? Correct. How did that imagery was that part of the band when when you got on? It was just coming out as I was, you know, kind of kind of exiting the band, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, 
it wasn't there from the very beginning. But you know, they, when I was in the band, you know, if, and you could listen to the album, it's not geared toward the you know the horror punk scene that that everything is today. Correct. So that image was coming about, you know, for me like toward the middle to the end when I was leaving. The band. That that horror punk kind of uh, yeah, and the and the crimson the ghost and all that, and all that stuff. You know what I mean? That, I mean, we use that skull on some buttons and stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, I wish I had the buttons, but it was just it was just coming about. It was nothing like. Really what is there? Yeah, right. it's. I mean, that that image is. Well, right. I mean, rock stars all over the place, and just every everyday citizens wear that shirt, either Correct. just the skull or it says the Misfits, and I, who knows if they even know what it is. But right. that image is 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 famous worldwide. Creating the static age and, and getting all the songs together. Once you had established what the songs were going to be and and how you guys came about developing the songs. Where did all the recording take place for the album? Well, everything, what happened was we had a label called, you know the Misfits now, you'll see a lot of stuff on Plan 9. Yes. Originally that was Blank Records. Mercury Records came out with a label called Blank. I don't know what, who had the rights to it, us or them, if they copyrighted it or what happened, but the short version is, in order for us to let them use the name and have the name, they they kind of paid us off in studio time mm. and recording time uh, with the intent that, with, with, with the thoughts that they were going to release our, our album, which they never did. So they gave us the studio time at CI, CI, CI Recordings, I believe it was on 58th or, 58th or 57th Street. In Manhattan. In Manhattan, yep. You know, so they uh, gave Achilles was their engineer. Mm. Uh, they gave us, you know, I think it was 20 hours. If I'm not mistaken, plus all the tapes, right. the master tapes, the mother wheel, and all that. But in the end, they never, they never. Right, and that's actually going to be one of my one of my questions that I have. You guys record the album, everything gets done, but the album gets shelved and wasn't released until I think it was 1996 when the album actually got released in a box set. Right, you'll see some previous versions like on Legacy Brutality, right. some of the songs yes. that were remixed yeah. and stuff like that. I mean, a lot of those, a lot of those songs, even though the album was never officially released. A lot of those songs were released on, on singles, yes. bootlegs. I mean, they were out there because I remember as a kid I, w I was able to hear them at that time. Correct. But the album itself of Static 8 was never released. Do you remember why it was never released? You know, what happened was back then when that whole scene, the punk rock scene was going on, the biggest thing going on, you know, you would put out a 45, get it in all the records. Back then there were a lot of record shops, mom and pop yes. shops, yep. you know, bigger shops. So you'd go around Manhattan, wherever, everywhere, and you know, some people would buy the record, you know, some people would let you put it in there for sale, and then they'd pay you later as if they had to pay you after it sold. So basic, basically, um, you know, that's kind of what would happen. So you'd release, you'd have a 45 right. come out. But do, we, do, you, do you remember why the album itself was? As a whole? Yeah. We, we would have put it out ourselves. Right? You know, basically, we were, we were playing and doing work and putting the money back into the bank. Right. You know, and you're not making a whole lot of money when you're doing it yourself. Right. And let's, let, let's, to be realistic, let's be realistic, the punk rock scene was kind of an underground thing going Absolutely. on. You know, and there were CBGBs in New York and Max's Kansas City, you know? Right. And I was just going to ask you that. Were you, did you ever play at CBGBs with the, the Misfits? Misfits only played CBGBs, I believe, one time before I was in the band. Probably shouldn't say this, but if I remember correctly, Hilly, the owner, promised him X amount of dollars. He never paid him, and Glenn said, you know, F you, so to speak, we'll never play here again. So Max has kind of became our home after that. Right. If I remember correctly, as a kid, I could remember that the Misfits played was it Hitsville in the sake a lot? Was that? Was they played. They uh, Hitsville. They played in Hitsville. Yeah, I remember they played. I remember that. Remember I left, that was after I left the band. Yeah. Okay, so you were in it at yeah. that time. Yeah. So you guys put together Static Age, and and I got to be honest with you, right? Some of the songs on here to me, I think, are the best Misfit songs that yeah. that were on on any of their albums. I mean, there's great songs on the other albums, but to me, when I when I listen to Static Age, and just to to draw attention to a couple of the songs now. When we talk about the Misfits and the songs, you, you have to realize you're not going to listen to the Eagles or the Temptations or Cool and the Gang. This is hardcore punk. It's gritty, it's dirty, it, it's raw, but the songs are there and they and they just they just rock out. So if you look them up on YouTube, don't think you're going to listen to easy listening music. 
It's hardcore, horror punk. Although this album is not really in the horror punk right. thing, but it's it's all there. So if you if you look them up and you look up some of these songs, understand that this is punk rock, and it's not casual listening or easy listening music. So, but again, some of these songs on here are like my favorites. And, and just to go down down a couple of them, and we're going to talk about the influences that you guys actually had on some major rock rock bands. So. Right off the bat, the name of the album, Static Age, Last Caress, Attitude, We Are 138, Hollywood Babylon, and Bullet. I mean, some of those songs right there, just those songs alone, I think, are, are instant classics for the Misfits. And, and I know they play most of those songs live to that. Yes, they do. They do. And the first single had four of those songs that you listed on. Right. We're on one single. Right. Um, so some of the influence, I mean, you you guys, the Misfits themselves, influenced a lot of other rock and roll bands out there and, and punk bands that came after you guys. But two of the biggest biggest rock and roll bands ever, Guns N' Roses and Metallica, both did cover songs of your songs. Guns N' Guns N' Roses being they did Attitude on the Spaghetti Incident album, and Guns N' Roses uh, Metallica does Last Caress on Garage Days Revisited. Correct. When they did, now that was even before this album was even Correct. released as as a as a full length album. When those two bands did those songs, how did that how did that make you feel? Well, like you felt time? great, like you, like these bands are they, they're they're like two big bands playing stadiums, yeah. and they're putting out albums with the songs I played on. Right, it's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I would think that would have yeah, been, pretty you cool. know, especially being Guns N' Roses and Metallica. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty cool. You don't get too much bigger than that. No, it's pretty cool. All right, so. You were in the band for what, about two years at that time? More or less, yeah, 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 20 years. And, and you wound up leaving the band. You left on your own accord, correct? correct? Do you remember why you left? Basically, at that time, we had just did a tour. Uh, we just come back from Canada. Um, things didn't go as planned, you know. Um, I was a little bit frustrated with traveling. You know, we, we, toured, we, would, we did a Middle Eastern tour. Um, that was pretty good out in Cleveland, Ohio, out that way. Uh, I believe we're in Chicago too. In Canada. I, I thought musically, people will say, oh, he didn't like the tour, he didn't like the tour. I don't know. I was young, I was a little paranoid of the whole scene maybe. I won't say it's cool. I won't say it's hundred percent true, but I won't say it's hundred percent false either. But in any event, I thought musically I said, I could do some better things. This is great. We can do this. Musically wise. Not that right. the music was bad, but I thought musically I could do something better. Who knew? It, you know. Afterwards, I once saw an interview with Lou Reed, and a lot of these songs are three and four chord songs, okay? And he said, it's not how talented of a musician you really are, it's how you take, let's say, those three chords and play them. And I never forgot that. Right. And what you make of those three chords. Right. So, you know, that's said by Lou Reed. By Lou Reed, yeah, I saw an interview with him, I forget where, but it was on, it was on TV when I saw it. Well, let me ask you because you said it about the scene. Were you into the, were you into the punk scene even like were you was that your scene the punk scene or did you like fall into the Misfits and that's just the way it evolved for you or? Yes. Well, when I it just this is what we were doing. So you know we we were the real deal. <laughs> I, I'm not going to lie. You. you know it was no like when you see some of these things that happen like with some of these crazy bands. Yeah, it happened. People were rebellious against the punk scene. Right. Some people were totally into it. Some were really rebellious against it. And basically we we fell into it. I mean, you know, no, with, I was in Lodi. Right. You know, now we're playing this band and like I said, we played, you know, some places in Jersey and all, but we were, you know, playing New York a lot, you know. Right. So and that was the whole that was the underground scene going on. I mean, when you look at the Misfits today and and from where you came from, I mean, it took them many, many years to get to where they are today. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, so do you ever think about what could have been if you didn't? hundred percent. You do. hundred percent. You always, and not because of, well, yes and no. Of course they are where they are today. Does that, do you have regrets? Yeah, because you, you know what? Stick to something. Stick to it long enough. Give it the best. And you know what? You can always succeed at it if you keep trying at it. But I just thought I could do something different, and it was still in the same scene, right. but a little bit different music. So you, so you leave the Misfits, and you leave again. And we said on your own, on your own accord. Right. And then uh, uh, another guitar player, I believe he's from New York, Bobby Steele. Then yeah, he over took over. Her. He took over for a couple of months before yeah. Doyle took over. And then, then 
Doyle, Wolfgang von Frankenstein yes. steps in, which is actually Jerry Only's brother. Right. And he's, they, they've been, you know, together on and off ever yes. since. He is the image, man. Right. He is the image of the band. Abs absolutely. Absolutely. So you leave the band, and what do you do from there? I mean, musically, what do you, what do, you do? I was from playing there? with a friend of mine, you know, we were playing a couple of bands, doing a couple of different things, you know, um, but nothing ever really. You know, you know, we turned down gigs with some big bands, don't ask me why. We could have played with Iggy Pop, we said no. We turned down a couple of big things because we said we're not ready for this, we're not ready for that. And you know what? Big mistakes. Right. Big mistakes. And and you, you the name of your band was at the time was active in the Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and how long were you? They were together before me, and I guess that was about a year. Were they Lodi guys also, or? Most. No. One, two. Most of them were, yeah, but not one, one of them wasn't. So one of them was from New York, yeah. Okay, so most of the guys there were yeah. also from Rhode Island. So, musically, what are you, what are you into now musically? Do you do anything musically now? I mean, yeah, listen, I didn't play for many, many years. You know, once I settled down, got married and had kids, I kind of, another mistake, you know, put the guitar down because right. I have four kids, you know. And right. My wife's, you know, you got to work, you got to live, you know, Absolutely. so I put the guitar down for, 20 years. I mean, I didn't pick it up. So, uh, but now, yeah, now I play more than, you know, I play more, you know, I have a, I, I had a recording studio, which is now a rehearsal studio in my house, and yeah, we'll see. And, and what kind of music are you playing now? It's kind of, not like that, but it's also not straight rock and roll, you know what I mean? It's kind of, I, I don't know, I don't like to put a, a name on things. To well, me, everything to is me, right. everything I is think right. Doyle said this once. If, the, even the punk rock. It's just rock and roll. Right. To me, it's just it's rock just, and roll, but that's the genre that it yeah, got, exactly. that's the same, genre same got put into. Right. It got same put thing. into the punk. And, and that's, same thing. That's, we were working on something last night. If When I was listening to it today, I was like, wow, that's really, really some some metal type of stuff. But when I was playing, it didn't sound, come off like that. So, you know, like you said, to me, it's all rock and roll. Yeah. And I just want to, before we end our, 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 our interview, I just want to go back to the static age and talk to you a little bit about the liner notes. Right. I know we've talked about it yes. in the past, but in the line notes, you, you, you thank a lot of a lot of low-life people. You thank Sal B, you, uh, Stephen Zing. Right. But in the line notes, from Static Age, they thank the low -life Police Department for cutting rehearsals short. What, what was that about? Did you even remember that? Yeah. Okay. After I told you when Manny, we used to practice by Manny at the beginning, but obviously once it's, you know he had the fire and he left the band, we brought it to Jerry's house on Grove Street. Right. And we had a, a nice rehearsal studio in his garage. Yes. And I guess for the neighbors, it would get loud. And they called police. Right. And the police would come, you know, kindly ask you to lower it down or blah, blah, blah. And they were always very good with us. You know, they never did anything like, you know, I got to shut it down or this or that. We would say, okay. And, you know, maybe they'd say, you know, take a break for 20 minutes or give the neighbors a break or whatever. So they were pretty good with us and letting us practice and rehearse. Right. That's where the thanks comes from. Right. And also, I'm looking at I'm looking at your shirt right now and I, and I see you're wearing an Elvis shirt. Yes. And, and when I do listen to the to this album, especially this album, I know his influ Glenn's influence were was Roy Orbison and, and uh, I think Jim Morrison. But to me, on this album when he sings, I mean, the music, is like machine gun fire, but over that is his is his vocals, and, and to me when I hear it, it sounds like he's you know it's like an Elvis Presley sound on steroids. That his, right, you know, was that his intent to have that 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 tone to his voice? I don't know exactly, but as you know, Danzig himself just released an Elvis uh, an Elvis yes, album. Yes, I, 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 I have. Okay, uh, I was a big Elvis fan, and you know, still am. Yeah. Um, he was, as he's, Glenn was, as he said, but, you know, Glenn has that voice. He, had, he has a voice. You know, so a lot of these singers, you know, they're singing a lot of falsetto. Right. No matter what the music is, he's not singing falsetto. He's hitting the notes. He's, he's doing it the right way. Right. So that's his, that's that's, his, yeah, that's his voice. That's, you know, right. is he trying to duplicate, you know, Elvis Presley or whomever? I don't think so. Uh, maybe he's taking some style because Glenn was always himself. Yeah. Again, you know, just listening to him sing it and, and just bringing me back that yeah. that sound of even though the music is 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 going like a mile an hour, mile a minute, his voice brings it back with with tones of of the Elvis yeah. Elvis Presley sound. 
we spoke a little bit about the Misfits at, from when you played to today's. I mean, it took them almost 40 some odd years yeah. to get to, to the stature that they're at. I mean, and we just spoke about it, myself, my son, and, and uh, uh, we had a, a whole crew of, of Lodi people from Lodi Pizza who put a, a, a party together or a, a bus tour for us to go to see them at the Madison Square Garden back last October, which they completely sold out Madison Square Garden. So, I mean, when we were at that garden show and, I, and I'm sitting there and, and seeing that we're at a sold out show for the Misfits from guys from Lodi, at that point you have still three guys from Lodi. You had the Glenn, you had Jerry, and you had the Doyle. Yep. Still in the band, I mean, Lodi roots, and here they are selling out Madison Square, not just only Madison Square Garden. I mean, I didn't get to go, but my son went to the, he went to the, uh, the show in Newark, and yep. the show in Philly, all sold out to yep. capacity. I mean, how did they get from where they were to, to where they're now and I believe they were supposed before the COVID hit. I believe they were supposed to play a a, a, a big stadium stadium show in Mexico. In Mexico but it yeah. well, they did a, they did Bank of America Stadium in California prior to the Garden, which was sold out. Also, right. uh, basically, there were some legal things going on between Jerry and Glenn, and they always said, if you know the history of the Misfits, there'd never be a reunion. That was the biggest thing. But never, never, never. So the, from, what I, from the way I gather it, they came to terms that the way they could settle this legal dispute would be they do a couple of reunion dates. Mm -hmm. a, a couple of dates turned out so well, I guess maybe bigger than they expected, it needed to a couple more dates. Right. And before you know it, like you said, they sold out big, big places. And you were at the Garden Show, correct? I was at all three of the shows you named. Oh, you were? I was at, I was with, I'm still friends with all those guys. You know? That was going to be one of my questions. You're yeah. still in, in touch with them? And yeah, I talk to Jerry. I won't say every day, but we, we speak often. Right. You know, I talk to Doyle. Um, you know, Glenn, obviously, you know, he's on the West Coast. But, um, and I'll tell you, the biggest part of the reunion, Dave Lombardo, great. Yes. Great drummer. Drummer from Slayer. Great drummer and great, great individual. I had a lot of, uh, some couple of conversations with him, real nice guy. And he, and he makes that band right now, I'll tell you that. Okay. All right. Well, Frank, this basically that's going to be, I mean, like you said, when you get together, you want to come back with your band that you're playing, and uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll do it again, and we'll have you on again. And, okay. Uh, thank you for, for coming in. Thanks, Anthony. All right, Lord I. That was our interview with Frank Licata, a.k.a. Franche Coma. If you want to do yourself a favor, again, it's not easy listening to music. The Misfits Static Age. Check it out. Some great songs on there. We hope to see you soon. Stay safe, stay Lodi strong. Have a great day and God bless. Thanks.